Hi, Selamat Siang. It's middle of the day here in Bali, and it's so good to to be with midwives. This morning I got up early and went over so that I could hug the night shift midwives that were going off shift at Bumi Sehat and give them little gifts before the morning shift came on. And um, yeah, later today I'll post on my social media the beautiful faces and names of the midwives that helped me to give birth when my children were born. So um, today we're talking about something that might be a little bit um, not so wonderful to think about, and that is um, the many disasters and crises that are happening in our world today. Um, and some of the people actually on this um, on this Zoom link with us um, have, have been to disasters with me and have been to disasters that I haven't been to. Um, it's such an essential role for midwives, for doulas, uh, for birth keepers of all kinds, because when all infrastructure is lost, we know that those mothers that are expecting babies still have to have their babies and they have to have skilled people who can help them and guide them and hold them through the experience and through the, through, you know, pregnancy, birth, postpartum, breastfeeding, all of that, even when they're homeless, even when they haven't got clean water to drink or food to eat. So these are things that all of you may want to think about in the future because I find that midwives and doulas are more ready to be um, of practical use during those times than people with sort of um, medical degrees that, that require them to be in hospital settings more. Um, of course, we know that midwives can work in hospitals, but we also know that they can receive babies in Coca-Cola trucks and tents because we've done it. And we've done it with a lot of success and a lot of love. So let's go to the next slide, Linda. Oops, is that the next slide? We didn't skip one, yeah. Okay, so these are um, the disasters that Bumi Sehat has been early responders to, um, quite a few of them already. You know, whenever there's a, another storm, another fire, another earthquake, we always hope that it's small. Um, we just had an earthquake offshore in the Philippines a couple of days ago, a couple of nights ago, and it um, it was very frightening, and they had a tsunami warning, but fortunately nobody was killed and the buildings were okay. We ha Our midwives do have some strife there. But um, so th these, are, these are our experience as midwives. Okay, next slide. Um, that's Maria Teresa Maniego. We call her Tet. She's holding one of the babies. She's the executive director at um, Bumiwada, Philippines. And that's one of our mothers that gave birth recently there. Right now, the temperature at the, at the Baha'i Aruguan Ni Maria birthing center that we, that we manage there um, is, has been between 48 and 41 degrees Celsius. So you can imagine how hot that is. And we are really struggling to keep our mothers well hydrated, cool. Uh, the electricity is pretty much out in the area, but fortunately Direct Relief International has provided us with a full solar system. So we can run fans, mothers can come and you know get drinking water and, and get cooled down a little bit. And, uh, and of course, have their prenatal care, their birth services, their postpartum care. We have the highest rate of teen pregnancies there in the in the Philippines in that particular region after Tanzania. Women are the hardest hit in disasters. Um, the responses by the major NGOs are usually geared towards the needs um, of men, not the particular needs of women and children. Um, a woman in, or a child in a disaster is 14 times more likely to die than a man. Okay, next slide. Um, you can see that this is a birthing center, which what you can't see is there's no roof on it in the central Philippines after the typhoon Haiyan, which you can see the size of that typhoon and a little bit of the Philippines on the um, screen there. Uh, this mother had lost her two-year-old daughter in the ocean surges, which are like tsunamis during the storm. And um, she was in labor at this moment with her husband uh, just just three short weeks after the storm. Um, we know that over 2 million women who were pregnant were affected by that one typhoon. 
So it's always an issue. It's always important that we as birth keepers are ready to respond. Okay, next. Life stories. Okay, next slide. I love this beautiful mother. She was 16 years old um, after the big earthquake in Nepal. Actually, there were a few earthquakes, the second largest one. I was there to experience that. Um, and an ambulance came to the birthing center, which had fallen down. There was still one building standing, but it was leaning over. So we would try to run in there and grab equipment out, like things like a bed. Um, we were doing births in tent and um, tents from direct relief with help from every mother counts. And this ambulance came rocking up in the middle of the day and Shanti, one of the beautiful midwives there, the Nepalese midwives and I looked at each other and we said, that's a, that's a mother having a baby. We could feel it. And we opened up the back door of the tent and a whole bunch of hay and straw and goat droppings fell out. And a mother was trying to climb down and we helped her. And it was obvious from the size of this mother's belly that she was in strong labor with twins. And her first twin was born without any um, issues at all. And the second coming twin was in deep distress. So we were able to um, help her to have her babies, both of them safely. Um, she's holding a little solar light and a water filter there. Uh, she didn't smile, uh, even in the days postpartum. But every time she spoke to us, she put her feet on our feet. And she kept saying to us, my children were born homeless. My babies were born homeless. We found out later that when she was 14 years old, she had a baby that lived 18 months and died of pneumonia. So this young woman has had a hard life, and we were happy to be able to at least mitigate her suffering. Okay, go ahead to the next slide, Linda. This is Ibu Eli in Aceh. Um, during the tsunami, two of her four daughters were washed away. Her baby was washed out of her arms. Her toddler was washed out of her daughter's arms. Her uh, her teen daughter went on to uh, to become a midwife after this experience. And um, my hands were telling me that Ellie was going to be having twins. They made love once after the tsunami. So 11 months after the big, terrible event where over 260,000 people were were separated from their bodies, souls were separated from their bodies in that one day. Um, the military actually says it's much more than that, but that's the recorded amount. Anyway, uh, 11 months later, she received these babies into the world. She gave birth to beautiful twins. Um, it was really a celebration for the community and a sign of hope that these baby girls could um, be born. Now, the tsunami was 19 years ago. This December, it will be 20 years old. And so these girls will be, you know, 19 turning 20. Um, a beautiful, again, a ray of hope is what new life brings in these disasters. Okay, next. This hole in the ceiling was where Joy Abuyubar the midwife you see wearing pink and her husband and her daughter were able to push a mother with a one hour old baby up through the hole. Now the ceiling, the roof has been put back on, but the roof during the, uh, the big typhoon blew off. The ocean surges filled the entire birthing center with water. And so the only way to save the mother and the baby and her family was to push them up through that hole during the storm. And for hours they hung on for life and were saved. Um, it, what a brave, incredible midwife. And you see there our beautiful um, Mercy in Action midwife. She is just wonderful. And I love Vicki Penwell. She's worked in disasters also and been a, a just a beautiful beacon of hope for us. Okay, next. I love these, this picture because uh, the, the beautiful mother wearing pink was the older sister very big pregnant and her younger sister was having her first baby in our tent in the Philippines. And maybe um, I think um, Tet Maniago and the Bahia Aruguan family, Tina Ferreros and um, Jacqueline Aurora will be there watching. They will remember this, this pair of sisters. So the sister wearing the kind of greenish white dress, she was, her baby was crowning in the tent with the help of the midwives. And we had a doula, um, Lola Toba was there 
from the U.S. and helping us by keeping records and making sure the moms were all being hydrated and fed properly. And the elder sister, as her younger sister was, was giving birth, her water released onto the floor of the tent and we started laughing. So these two babies from sisters were born within an hour of each other, less than an hour in the same tent in the disaster zone. And when we, when we went to take them home, we asked them if they had a home. And they said, yes, we still have a home, kind of. And when we brought them home, this bit of concrete was all that was left of their home. And they never complained. We were able to provide them with tarps. with to, And we, we erected the tarps so they at least could get out of the rain. Mosquito nets, uh, a little kerosene stove with fuel, rice, mung beans, um, and of course, instant foods like um, granola bars. We gave them a water filter so they could catch the water off of the tarp and the rainwater, and they could filter it for drinking water, and we gave them a solar light. So we were able to set them up with some kind of shelter to get through the next few weeks while the rebuilding began. But it, it was pretty terrible. And yet no complaining, just gratitude. Okay, next slide. I love this couple, Shirley and her husband. They had twins. Uh, Gian, the little boy who was wearing a yellow hat, was born with schisis with all of his intestines were on the outside of his body. And um, anyway, and, and congenital irregularities of his spine, obviously something that was not, um, it wasn't possible for him to live a long life, but he lived for five days. And his the second coming twin, his sister, is growing up strong and naughty and joyful and uh, since they've had another baby and um, so this couple was able to have a baby even in a very difficult situation they were homeless at the time in our tent in the philippines our birthing tent okay next slide good practices well let's talk about that okay Collaborative care, it's so important. You can see a picture here of our midwives in Aceh that are, uh, there are, it's a mix of traditional birth intendants called Dukinbayi in Indonesia or Hilot in the Philippines. And they're working with the licensed midwives who have um, a college education and a license, a national license. And they work together in such a beautiful collaborative way. And I feel like this is the way that we can really save lives in disasters by working together. It's culturally safer. It helps all people feel like uh, they have a access to the most uh, comfortable and skilled way to give birth to have skilled birth attendants and to have the comfort of their culturally appropriate caregivers and birth keepers. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Susanna. <laughs> okay. Yes. This is a, an earthquake that wasn't a really big one in Bali happened about a year and a half ago. It was just about a five, like a 4.9, but it was in an area where, and a kind of earthquake where we had 1,117 homes were downed and a lot of homes that were not livable, even though they were still standing, they weren't safe. And so our midwives and our entire team went out with food supplies, with medical relief. I mean, things like um, suturing the injured, making sure that people's bones were properly set when they were broken and making sure that the pregnant mothers had the support they needed. So that was Bali just about a year and a half ago. Okay, next slide. Um, in, after Typhoon Haiyan, what we discovered, and we discovered this in many disasters, but it was really apparent then, um, in the first two months after the typhoon, we had 14 breech babies. And um, there were 770, well, there were 777 babies born, but seven of the data sheets got so wet when they got blown away in the next big rain that we uh, we couldn't use the data. We had six hospital transports in all of those births, only six transports to hospital, and the hospital really was in bad shape. It wasn't really much to transport to. And we had two VBACs because there are very few um, belly births or cesarean births in that part of the Philippines. And imagine there were 14 breech babies and midwives were well-trained and able to 
help with this. Um, and of course, we didn't we didn't just have midwives. We had um, a couple of OBs that came and, and volunteered as well. But one of the most important things was to get the Filipino midwives back working and up on their feet, even though they were homeless. So, And same thing in Haiti, same thing everywhere we are going in Indonesia, is to try to get the local midwives back on their feet so that they can help their own people, which means if they're homeless, get them shelter. If, they're, if their families are hungry and grieving and, and you know, not, they don't have potable water, we need to get them, take care of them first so that they can start working again as soon as possible. But midwives, you have to be, be skilled and ready to receive breech babies into the world in this time of so many, so much strife on earth and so many changes. Please be prepared. If that means taking a special course or whatever, um, it's really something that we need to have our skills. I know that in most countries, those babies are meant to give birth now in hospital, and most hospitals will force them to have cesarean birth or belly birth. But when there's no hospital, we need to be ready to help. Okay, next. Delayed umbilical cord clamping and cutting. I believe this is probably my biggest life passion. Please do not clamp and cut cords immediately. All of these babies are still connected hours later to their placentas. There's no hurry. We midwives know that. I'm preaching to the choir, but two to three minutes is not enough. We don't even think waiting for the white is enough. We want those mothers to go ahead and breastfeed and do skin to skin and bonding and getting to know their babies before there's anyone interfering with that beautiful first embrace of life. The Unan Yakap, we call it in the Philippines. The Palut Partama, we call it in Indonesia. Where the first embrace of life, it's so sacred. And we don't want to interfere with it by clapping and cutting the cord. And I will tell you, my own granddaughter, who was a VBAC after my daughter had an emergency belly birth because her first child five and a half years ago, the placenta was abrupting because of climate crisis, because she was in that part of California where a third of the homes and businesses burned. And they had a lot of um, abrupting placentas right after those fires and during the next two years. And it's they think it's because of the plastics in the groundwater. And then the next baby was born two years later for my daughter. And her cord was wrapped around her neck five times. And she had a beautiful, gentle, vaginal birth with me and with beautiful midwife Cassandra Jaw, and um, and we did not clamp and cut that cord, even though it was quite tight around her neck five times. So it's really possible to keep the umbilical cord intact, even during resuscitation, especially during resuscitation. So that's the kind of thing that we need to be ready for, and we need to practice, and we need to just really let that umbilical cord because babies have trauma from being separated from mother. They also have trauma from being separated from their placentas too soon. Okay, next. This is a way that you can, when you're in a situation where there's no way to sterilize properly your, your scissors, your cord clamps, your tools, um, in disaster zones, you can use fire. So try, I always bring, um, I bring candles and we make sure that we make... Um, cardboard heat guards uh, for the to make sure that we safely burn the umbilical cord about 8 to 10 centimeters from the baby's belly um, to make sure that it's not too close and it's safe to burn the umbilical cord if you're really careful and that will cauterize the cord and there's no chance of tetanus when you do it with this method. And this method is um, described in my book Placenta, the Forgotten Chakra, which we'll hold up later. Okay, so... Um, please, that's a good skill to have. It's an ancient skill. Um, traditional birth attendants, attendants used it for centuries before they ever got scissors. So um, I like cord clamp, clamping and cutting when it's necessary and when it's actually done safely and with sterile procedure. It's a sterile procedure because it's not, it's, it's dangerous to clamp and cut the cord with scissors if it's not done properly. Burning the cord is only done safely when people are very careful. So midwives be very careful, but it is a way in disaster zones to safely sever the umbilical cord um, without using scissors. Okay, next. Okay, midwives had to be flexible. In the early COVID-19 days, it was required in Indonesia 
for us to have hazmat suits or um, PPEs, personal protective um, garments, uh, in order to attend births. That was just part of the regulations. We had to be able to test the mothers and we had to have our PPEs. Well, in Papua, you couldn't get any of those things, but our Papuan midwives went out and bought themselves rain jackets and rain pants, and it's much hotter there than in Bali, and they wore those so, so that they could still legally attend births and having their PPEs being rain jackets. So I'm so, my heart is so grateful to them that they continue to stay open and operational even in the early days of COVID when so many people were afraid and they and they were able to find a creative solution so that they could still legally practice when they couldn't acquire um, any PPEs or any hazmat suits of any kind in their area, but they were able to find a way. So midwives find a way. Birth keepers find a way. Okay, next slide. Breastfeeding, breastfeeding, breastfeeding. I know I am speaking to the, I'm preaching to the choir here. All of you midwives I know are totally devoted to breastfeeding, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a earthquake or a flood or a fire um, or a typhoon. The only way to actually reasonably and safely feed our babies is breastfeeding, which requires support. I don't believe mothers fail to breastfeed. I believe that their support systems fail them. Um, and yeah, so please support breastfeeding. We have 100% breastfeeding at our Bumi Sayat locations. Whoops. Okay, next slide. Collaborations. Ah, we Care Solar has helped us so much, and our team in the Philippines is actually online here. I see them. Um, we, Ted and the and the midwives in the Philippines and the birth keepers, the doulas, they distributed solar lights and solar suitcases from We Care Solar. Um, wine to water, beautiful Sawyer's water filters, which was. It, we were able to get the midwives in the far-flung areas who had no electricity and no potable water. We were able to get them back working by um, working in collaboration with these beautiful nonprofit organizations that provide water filters and lights. Okay, next. Uh, there's Jacqueline Aurora, who one year ago was on the ground after the big Maui fires to make sure that the mothers who had no road access to um, to hospital care could still get access to midwives. They also, uh, so many people were left homeless and without electricity, and it's still an ongoing disaster situation there in Maui. Um, that uh, That's Jacqueline Holt, helping a mother by keeping a newborn baby who was a preemie skin to skin while the mother was using the bathroom with her husband. And and in the front, what you don't see is the baby's clothes are open, so they're skin to skin. And then you see her beautiful Lorena. And Lorena's in, um, in the central Philippines, in Samar. She has her own birthing clinic. Her daughter is now fully grown and has become a midwife. And Lorena used to wear lipstick every day to receive babies into the world in tents. And one day we asked her, we said, you look so pretty when you come to work every day, every night. And how, why do you wear lipstick? And she said, this beautiful pink smile is not for any man. This is a Valentine. And that every mother who comes here to have a baby, when she sees my face, my face says, I love you to her. It's a Valentine of love from, from the midwife to the mother's. And she is just such a lovely midwife. She texts, she sends me text messages regularly. And there she's just holding that baby and waiting for the new mother to reach for her baby for that first embrace, giving that mother a, just a little pause between being pregnant and having a baby in her arms so that the mother has a choice to empower herself and reach for her own baby. And that's something that we do pretty routinely in all of our locations in the Philippines and Indonesia. And um, so skin-to-skin -skin contact, um, when you're in disasters, you may have a, quite a lot of preemies and you won't have 
um, access to electricity or incubators or any high-tech equipment to keep them alive. But we found that we could keep them alive by doing that beautiful skin-to-skin and exclusive breastfeeding. And Jacqueline Aurora was one of our breastfeeding and skin-to-skin contact for preemies heroes. She's still a hero. So these are beautiful midwives. Jacqueline started out as a doula, became a lactation consultant, and went on to become a beautiful midwife working in disaster zones. Okay, next. These anti-shock garments are wonderful. And Sue Ellen Miller through Life Wraps. You might take a screenshot with your phone of this so that you know that you can get them through Life Wraps. Um, they can be they, they're made of neoprene. They can be washed. You can put them on. Um, the mother, when, you're, when she's lost so much blood that you can't get an IV in her. And sometimes mothers will give birth in a disaster zone on their way to finding midwives. And so we put these on. They have to be put on and taken off properly. Um, simple. They're very simple. There are no moving parts. There are no um, electronic parts, just this beautiful, um, it's like a dive suit. And you put it on and, and, it, and it pushes the blood to the mother's organs, heart, lungs, brain, and saves lives. And so we do trainings and in the, our team in the Philippines and our team in Indonesia has been distributing these, um, making sure that all of our locations have them in case that in case we have big bleeds it makes it so that you can you have time to get a mother transfusions if you can't get transfusions you can get her some fluids in and you can and you can they're also designed so you can still clear the vagina of any retained placenta or anything like that and the mother can breastfeed with this suit on okay next uh, working in partnership with direct relief international that's gordon hi gordon and uh, many families there, one, two, three, four families. We have um, families, midwives, and we have our Dula Toba, Lola Toba there next to Gordon. We had one night where a mother was brought by a doctor. Um, he was driving a car that was, it was, I don't know how he was driving. It had been crushed during the typhoon by flying trees. And he brought a mother in who was convulsing, a first-time mom. And we were able to get, an IV in her and get the mag self in. We were able to safely receive her baby into the world. And while this entire drama was going on in the birth tent, I heard one of the Filipino midwives yell at the top of her lungs. She said, somebody wake up our doula because we needed extra hands on board. We needed extra help making sure that all the mothers were okay and that, and that the, and that the records were being kept and the food, the food and the, the, fluids were flowing for these mothers. So that's when I really love that. When I heard that midwife yelling, somebody wake up our doula. So working in collaboration is really important. We have so many beautiful organizations that help us direct relief international, every mother counts earth company there and there are others as well. So thank you. Next slide, Linda. Okay. Community support. You know, these are two mothers that, we're able to uh, find their way to our birthing clinic in Lombok after the 2018 um, earthquake. And our community clinic and birthing center in Lombok is fully licensed. It's, we were in 18 months intense, but now we're so blessed that we have a permanent facility built by Direct Relief International. But these mothers gave birth in tents or were transported or gave birth in, in trucks. They were transported by community members who found them they did not know where the birthing clinic was but they were in labor and in distress and people from their community brought them to us in trucks so um, because because we had made collaborative agreements with them we now have a proper ambulance in Lombok thanks to um, Michael Franti and the Soul Rockers who helped us with that beautiful project and global giving okay next And these are the midwives of Angel Hiromi, Bumi Sehat in Sintani, Papua. They go the distance. This is small islands out on Lake Sintani that have no medical help at all. They have no way to grow their own food except they have fish. So they're very blessed and fortunate. And our midwives do regular visits out to the islands. And then they're available 
Um, they, they give the pregnant mothers uh, little handphones so they can contact us and little handphone plans so they can contact us in labor and we can arrange for them to come in or we can arrange to go to them. Um, so our ambulance is always ready and there are people in the community that have boats that can bring them in. Um, so we have mothers dying on those islands, but and that's not happening anymore now that they have our, our midwives helping them. Okay, next slide. You can see our midwives do <laughs> go the distance. That's midwife Lily, and she's rowing out to actually an island where she was born and raised, and she grew up to be a midwife. And we make sure that those women on those islands and those remote, remote far-flung areas do have care. Also in the Philippines, the women from the outer islands um, offshore are able to come in and um, there are waiting huts um, built by our team there and with funding from Every Mother Counts so that they can definitely um, get the care they need. Uh, midwife Farida Salman lost her life to the COVID-19. She was a beautiful, amazing midwife loved by the community and her husband and three daughters and we still honor her and we love her um she was taking care of people during the pandemic and and she was diabetic so when the um the covid got her it was very quick that she was taken from us okay next slide you can see this mother used to have a home before the earthquake and she and her husband were able to build this little home and that golden chain of love, um, the midwives were able to come to her when she contacted them saying that with her third baby, she woke up in labor and couldn't move. And so they were able to go to her and receive her baby into the world and give her postpartum care where she was. Um, it, it's really important that golden chain of love, as Dr. Iftikhar calls it at, at Project Hope in Bangladesh, and that every single one of you is a, a link in the chain of love and that the chain is strongest if we hold strong together and we work together in that golden chain of love. Okay, next. I love this beautiful drawing by a child who survived the tsunami. His father tied him in a coconut tree with his sarong and his entire family died and days later we found him in a coconut tree surviving barely alive but surviving because the the water got as high as the coconut trees and this was his drawing and i love this poem by kenneth patchen have you ever wondered why all the windows in heaven were broken have you seen the homeless in the open grave of god's hand and i feel like that is a poem that helps to sustain us as birth keepers okay next slide And there's so many crises, there's so many conflicts, there's so many midwives, some of them are tuned in here today who have had to really mitigate the, the fear and the trauma and to help the mothers in all situations. Ibu Budi Astuti, who's an incredible midwife, she's head of medicine in, at the Bumi Sehat, um, so not, not the Bumi Sehat Earthquake Relief Clinic that is now a permanent clinic in Lombok. She went with me to Bangladesh and helped women there, uh, the Rohingya women and the Bangla women. Um, she's just an incredible, beautiful woman who has survived terrible tragedy herself when her placenta abrupted and she lost her first daughter. And so this is a midwife to watch and to, um, to see how she, how she helps in the future because she is very poised to be one of the rock stars of our times. We love Ibu Budi so much. Okay, next. This is a mother, beautiful mother, who came in in uh, strong labor with twins. And our midwives at Bumi Sehat um, helped her to have her babies safely. Uh, she's just a beautiful mom. Those twins are so wonderful. And so, again, um, support your midwives locally. Support your doulas. Work together, midwives and doulas, and um, doctors and and everyone work together, birth keepers. We need your help. Okay, next. Thank you. I love this hand of a traditional Dukan Bayi. This was towards the end of her life, and I was still a young midwife, and she really um, taught me a lot about culturally safe and well informed care. And uh, I saw her 
do incredible, beautiful births. I helped her with, a, it was wonderful. So work together with your traditional birth attendants, those of you that are still blessed to have them because there aren't very many left in the world. Okay, is there anything more? Is that it, Linda? Ah, uh, International Childbirth Initiative. I can't say enough about this. It's in so many languages. Um, our team in the Philippines translated it into Tagalog. It's, um, it's a bit in Wari Wari as well, the 12 steps. Uh, we have it in Indonesian language for those of you in Indonesia and um, all over the world. You can, of course, get it easily in Spanish, French, so many languages. So um, please um, enjoy the International Childbirth Initiative. It is the vision and mission statement now for FIGO, the Federation International Gynecologists and Obstetricians. So it is really the revolution. And I say that meaning a small r with a big E. It's a revolution in childbirth and it is really... Um, on our terms, on, on women's terms. So I'm very, very excited about this. And all of our locations at Bumi Sehat in the Philippines and in Indonesia are partners with International Childbirth Initiative. So definitely Google it. <laughs>